Okay, I think we'll get started. I'm sure there'll be some stragglers joining us as we go. Um, so good morning. My name is Chris Deeran. I'm Director of Reform Scotland and I'm delighted to welcome you all to today's conference, Engaging the Disengaged Alternative Approaches to Education, which we are holding in partnership with our Commission on School Reform. At Reform Scotland, education, opportunity, compassion and political courage are at the heart of what we do and believe they're very much the reason we exist. So we're genuinely delighted to be standing behind today's conversation. And I think, as you can see behind me, I've even got a suitable background uh, for, for this session. This isn't actually the room behind me. Um, as you'll know from the invite, we're going to focus on those young people and school pupils who are perhaps not so well served by the current education system, the mainstream education system. These are children who are sometimes described as less able, low achieving, and disadvantaged in the academic sense, and, and who are too often left to drift towards adulthood disengaged, their horizons quickly narrowing in front of them. But we know that many of these young people have a, a spark and talents that with the right education and support could lead successful, fulfilling lives, which is good not just for them and their families, but for Scotland as a whole, economically, culturally, morally. This also speaks to the Scottish Government's stated intention to close the attainment gap, a strategy that is perhaps not currently working as effectively as, as many of us would like. Therefore, today we want to look at some of the pioneers and the innovations that are exploring alternative ways to reach, teach and in some cases save these kids. Over the next couple of hours we'll have speeches, interviews, short videos and plenty of opportunity for your questions and feedback. We'll hear from those inspiring innovators and education experts and from some of the young people who have benefited from their efforts so far. The aim of today is to spread knowledge about the work that's already going on outside the mainstream education system and to explore the challenges these projects face, understand their successes and to think about how we might do better across the whole of Scotland. I should say that today's turnout is, is hugely encouraging. It's actually the single largest turnout that we've had at Reform Scotland across all of the events that we've, uh, we've managed uh, online since the, the, the lockdown began. So we really hope that this will help drive a, a debate and a conversation about policy in this area and hopefully lead to positive change. Um, some of the questions you might want to think about today include if good relationships are critical to learning, what kind of settings best promote positive relationships with reluctant learners? How important are aspects of personal development, such as developing positive attitudes, self-belief and resilience? How are these best promoted? For able young people, the academic curriculum offers a vocational pathway. How are the vocational aspirations of less committed learners best met? And motivating and inspiring a disengaged learner has to be a partnership undertaking. Who are the key partners and how are they best brought together? Now, just before we get things underway properly, I just need to give you some important information, just some housekeeping, uh, and if, uh, if you could just uh, bear with me for this. So just to remind you that you should have pre-event mailing materials, you should have a conference programme, biographies of those taking part, uh, summary of the problems and the questions to consider, which are basically the ones I, I spoke about uh, a minute ago. You should have an excerpt from Kenny Kemp's forthcoming book, A for Achievement, A for Attitude, A for Attendance, The Life-Changing Endeavour of Newlands Junior College, a Glasgow success story. And there were two films that were sent to everyone in advance, The, the Voices of Newlands Junior College and Centre Stage Works, Stories Not Statistics. We would prefer it if you could keep your camera on. Uh, it does help these virtual events feel a bit more human and connected. Uh, and it's also very, I'll just repeat, very, very important that your microphone is on mute so that everybody's ears aren't invaded by background noise and coughing and hoovering and whinging children who are not enjoying homeschooling, etc. cetera. Um, equally, it's important that if it's your turn to speak, you remember to unmute yourself. Otherwise, uh, you'll just look slightly ridiculous uh, talking without any noise coming out. Um, I'm sure you're a very engaged and opinionated bunch uh, and we want you to send your questions and points for discussion throughout this event. We'll put as many as we can to our panelists across the morning. You can use this by using the chat function, which you'll see at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, so uh, if you just type your question out in there, send it to everyone. Uh, it would be helpful if you could note who the question's for, uh, otherwise I'll have to choose someone for you. But if you just wanna keep those questions coming across the morning uh, so that this becomes a conversation rather than just uh, 
people here lecturing the audience, it always works better if, if there's a bit of give and take on that. Um, I should also say that following the conference, delegates will receive uh, a detailed report uh, called Newlands Junior College Report 2014 to 2019. Uh, there will be a copy of uh, the Kenny Kemp book for everyone uh, when that comes out a bit later. Uh, and uh, if you email Gillian Hunt, whose email address is in your pre-conference pack, she will make sure that you get a copy of that book when it's published in the spring. And there will also be a conference report that will follow a second smaller event that we're going to hold in uh, before the end of February. And this event, for those who are interested, will discuss practical ways to promote innovation and take forward the lessons of the feature projects and other promising ideas that we learn about today. Again, please email Gillian Hunt if you'd like to be invited to join that conversation. So. We're really going to test the capabilities of Zoom today, and I feel a bit like Captain Kirk demanding ever more from the, the Starship Enterprise. You, you may hear Catherine, who's today's Scotty, shouting that she can't take much more, Captain, she's going to blow. Uh, but I'm sure all of the working parts will come together. If there's the odd glitch here and there, bear with us, but we will, we will get there. So with all of that said, uh, I'm going to introduce the first film. It's called Schooled. Uh, and it has a tiny bit of bad language in it, and I'm sure none of you use bad language, but uh, if you, just in case you have children nearby or whatever, just be warned that there is a small uh, amount of swearing in it. Uh, and Catherine, if you'd like to start that film for us. should be able to walk into any Scottish school and get a world-class education. That's a deeply precious commitment the state is making to every family in the country. And if it's not good enough, we'll have to improve it. For every major education change that's happened in the last 30 years, we've somehow still managed to end up with exams in May and June and in a big hall with rows and columns of desks and chairs. <sighs> Well, I would have liked to get taught about things that actually matter, like, like tax and stuff. Well, I don't see the point of geography. If I don't know where I'm, I'll just go on Google Maps. I've not been in school for like, I think it's been about two years. It was the end of S2 the last time I was there. I left at the start of S4, but I'm still registered. I've not done exams. Uh, I left when people were just starting exams, so I don't have anything. I left school when I was 15, but I didn't officially leave because I was young. I was supposed to be getting work from the school, but it's been like two years now and they've never sent me any work. It wasn't the work that I didn't like about school, it was the environment. My mum and dad didn't know what to do. They were like, why don't you go on BBC Bite Size? <laughs> yeah, the same. I was out of school for over a year, but even when I was there, I would be in a separate room the whole day. It was called the Pupil Support Centre. They didn't want me in class and that, so I just get the subjects delivered to me. I got maths textbooks, English textbooks, and stuff like that. See, the thing is, right? I was good when I was in class. I wasn't stupid. I think it just depends on who's in your class and what teacher you've got, whether you can behave. I used to get suspended for pure pointless things, like, I don't know, like I nearly get excluded for fighting, but I just get sent home for that, and I get sent home for video my fight, and like, like every week I was getting suspended after suspended after suspended, until it's got like, too much times, and then they never let me back in for like months. I only ever get suspended one time. I don't even know what it was for, actually. I think I was just arguing with one of my teachers, and I kind of like made her cry. But I think they don't try and like help. And like, what's like if you do something like bad, then mm, it's just you're suspended. Like, you come back, you do it again, you're suspended. You can get suspended every week. You don't try and fix the problems, do you know what I mean? Like, 
to find out why you're doing it, like if it's something deeper? I was in that support for learning and we just messed about. I was like the smartest one. We all wee dafties. <laughs> they were all at her. Hey. But like, see, the way I learn is like by somebody speaking to me and showing me, but it was basically just you go through that book there by yourself. But like, I don't learn that way. I need to be a bit encouraged. I've got anxiety and ADHD, and so coming to school was really tricky. Anxiety and depression. I didn't tell anyone for like two years. I didn't want to because I, I didn't want to annoy anyone or be like trouble. Is it compulsory for teachers to do mental health training? Well, I know we've got like, like people support, but we should be able to like, like really talk to a teacher that we've got a good relationship with because if every teacher would have done mental health training, then they would be able to deal with it. I and no just have like mental health week. Like they need to realise mental health doesn't just last a week. The teachers forget that they were all us at one point and in senior management forget that they were all teachers at one point. And another thing I think like like see like if schools and stuff were like you take advice from students and stuff about what to change because the best place for it to come from is like a student's mouth. Look, when we're trained to be teachers and stuff, right? But like, what are they learning? Like, what education do they get? Like, instead of them just being a teacher, they know the subject, so they're a teacher. Should there not be like certain, no rules, but like stuff they need to know? Do you know what I mean? Sometimes. Teaching your subjects the last thing a teacher needs to worry about. I mean, you come in and, and wee Johnny refuses to take his jacket off because he's not wearing a uniform and he hasn't got a pencil and then he belts the person sitting next to him. You just make such a big deal out of having a pencil or a uniform. <laughs> like, in my house, there's not even a table. I mean, like, not a surface to do homework on. And you think coming to school with a pencil or the right jumper is going to be top of my priority list? <laughs> Fuck off. Yeah, you can, do you? See, the thing that makes the biggest difference is that people believe in you. But for ages, I was told that I was no good. I was trouble, no clever. And so I didn't even try because well, I believed that I, I was that person. I was told I was on my last chance. How can you have had all your chances by the time you're 15? Education is your get-out clause. Your one chance to a better life. It's meant to be a pathway to a better future. Instead, your lives are written off before we've even started. It's not good enough. Schools maybe worked 40 or 50 years ago, but I don't think they're what's needed now. Everyone's expected to look, do the same thing and feel the same way if, if if you don't fit into a mainstream school there's no any options it's like do it i think it's such a stupid way to teach people it doesn't matter where you were born what your background is you should be able to walk into a scottish school and get world-class education A lot of food for thought there, and um, I know that uh, the, the, the script from that, which was uh, put together by Pauline Locker and uh, the Traverse Theatre, who put the thing together, was, was based on uh, actual conversations. So it's a bit of a, 
a window into maybe how the kind of children we're talking about today feel about the system as it is. So, so thanks again to Traverse and the actors and especially Pauline Walker for, for that today. Um, I'm now going to introduce our first conversation today, which is between Jim McCall, the founder of Newlands Junior College, and Ewan Aiken, the chief executive of uh, Cyrenians. I'll just remind you to keep your questions coming in uh, using the chat uh, function, and there'll be a QA and a along quite shortly where we will, uh, we will address any thoughts that, that you have. You can send your questions to anyone that's been involved in the, the pre-event uh, uh, documentation and so far today and, and anyone else you know who's here who you think would be interesting. So just keep the questions coming and uh, I'll now hand over to you and Aiken to interview Jim McCall. Yeah, thanks Chris and uh, um, it's good to be here. Welcome Jim, good to see you um, and uh, it's great to see so many people here today wanting to grapple with the kinds of issues that we've just uh, heard articulated so well in that previous uh, piece put together by the Travers. Jim, um, one of the last bits was about not fitting in. I wonder if that was the kind of idea that prompted you um, <coughs> to become to, to create uh, Newlands Junior College. Um, y yes, it, it, it was. I mean, it was obvious uh, when I was chairing Welfare to Work in Glasgow, I was looking at the flow into welfare, people leaving school without any qualifications and um, just drifting on to welfare with no support. Um, so that you know, that started me thinking, how do we address the onflow to, to welfare and help these young people? And it was through a number of interviews with uh, head teachers that, um, you know, we developed the idea that um, the, these people needed to be addressed in a different way. I, I, I did some background analysis of um, statutory leavers in Glasgow, and there were over 700 uh, leave in a year. And of those 700, 50% um, went, went to work or went into training, and, and that's fine, they were motivated. 30% went on to some sort of um, skills development course. I, I guess that was positive in that they're engaging with the system. But consistently, 20% disappeared off the radar and never engaged with support and were lost to society and I, I, I thought doomed to you know, a poor future. Now, I did check the same uh, statistics for Dundee and Edinburgh and it was uncannily the same, 50, 30 and 20. So we started to focus on the 20% to say we can't just let these people drift unsupported and they've not been supported for a number of years. And it was through a number of um, interviews with head teachers that we came up with the idea for Newlands Junior College. I'd been involved in a number of um, initiatives to look at the NEAT issue, um, reporting into the government, the, the Smith uh, group and so on. But it appeared to me that there was no change happening and nothing had happened for, you know, 30 plus years. And unless we, we changed the way we were looking at this, um, then um, we, we were just going to get the same results. So I, I thought the idea would be to, to prove, to look at what the solutions might be and to run a pilot for five years to prove the system, uh, to prove the, the new ideas we had. So, so you, you had both an analysis and, and an understanding of what the solutions might be. So, so how was Newlands Junior College different from a mainstream school? Well, it, it, for a start, it, uh, it, it focused on the, this cohort, the 20% that disappeared. And um, we were, it was clear that um, they weren't interested in a lot of academic subjects and choices, but you had to provide maths, English, science, and IT. So we settled on those academic subjects. But to try and engage them in interest, we provided um, a vocational uh, choice as well. Three half days a week, we would uh, send them to City Glasgow College.
Jim, I think you're on mute for some reason. I'm not quite sure how that happened. I was muted as well. Um, yes, yeah, someone sent someone centrally muted me yeah. there. I don't know where we. Um, I don't know if it's Captain Kirk or Scotty, but anyway, we'll we'll uh, we'll, we'll keep moving. You were just talking there about uh, you'd got you know the vocational element of the of the college. Yes, and, and I think that was important because most of the teachers and a lot of head teachers we spoke to said. If I could get money for a garage or a hairdressing salon in the school that I can engage their interest, that would be more helpful than some of the other uh, things. But I, you know, they, they couldn't do it. They were their hands were tied. So it was clear to give a range of vocational options, and um, you know, we had really good support from City of Glasgow College, who put together a, a fantastic program, and each each young person could choose. Um, uh, three subjects and we would take them there um, and we'd take them there on, on transport that we would provide. Um, and then the third leg was life skills. Um, you know, we had uh, ex-military people in taking them out uh, on um, outward bound courses. So we had a lot of life skill type qualifications as well. But I think the key was to get them out of the environment they were in. They weren't, they were being failed in that environment. So a key part of this, the, actually the key thing to do here was to get them into their own environment and nurture them. We picked them up in the morning from home. We gave them breakfast and we gave them lunch. And very, very quickly, these people engaged in the activities that um, we were putting in front of them. And when I asked them, you know, once they were a few weeks in, um, so, you know, why are you attending here? What's different here? You, you know, you seem to be enjoying it. The, the common answer was people care about us here. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they were, we weren't, it wasn't one size fits all. We were very flexible in the approach. And I've got to say that, um, I suppose that the other key factor here is the quality of the staff that you have. It has to be people that can deal with these young people, are flexible, are supportive, and we had a great team that we put together. So, so you had those three those three pillars, um, and, and and you had this um, much more relational based approach, and you did it for five years as a pilot. Yes. Um, you learn a lot. What 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 would you say is that? What do you think should happen now? Well, I mean, my hope was at the end of the five years that there would have been enough evidence there for this to be mainstreamed into Scottish education. That was always the uh, the, the the goal. However, at the end of it all, um, the key element that was needed was to have a separate environment for these young people and the decision was taken that we got some nice feedback on all the positive results we had and that um, the, the local authority would adopt um, most of our learnings, however they would put them back into the schools that they came out of and just customise a programme for them. Now that was just doomed to failure so um, what I would have liked to have seen was um, a number of these around Glasgow, because I think we probably need um, between three and five centres like this. It's not expensive. It's it's inexpensive. You know, that was one of the, the charges. I think we have too much inflexibility in the budgets that we have. Um, so what I would like to see is this that, that we need to make a diff we need to make a change. We need to do things differently for these people. They deserve to be supported, and the outcomes that we had from Newlands Junior College were mind blowing. the The transformation in these young people uh, was very difficult to um, to to believe could happen. 
Jim, I think that's the key word. Is it's, it was a it was a human transformation. It wasn't just an attainment of results in A, a, a or B. Jim, you've captured very well the the, the challenge and, and the opportunity. I'm very grateful to, to, to you for that. Um, I think particularly that that point you're making about what can happen, continue to happen in mainstream schools, and what needs to happen in a different environment. And I've noticed a couple of questions about that already, and I'm sure Chris will pick up on that. Thank you very much for 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 your res responses, folk. We'll have the chance to answer further questions of you as you go, uh, go along so we can unpack some more of the things that are, are there. What I would want to say, and I, and, and I know that you would agree with this, is that this is not somehow that everything is broken in mainstream and we have to, uh, you know, it's a, and it's a binary thing. Mainstream does a, education does a very, very good job, but as you articulated very well, there are still people slipping through the cracks and not getting what they need to flourish. This isn't a blame, bad, good conversation. It's how do we make sure that education is for everybody in the way that they they, they need it. Um, and what are the solutions? We're going to hear, uh, we're going to see now a film about some other solutions along with uh, Newlands Junior College, um, including one from my, my own organisation, some innovative alternatives that complement and can work alongside uh, the mainstream. And just a reminder, put those questions in the chat and do identify who it is you want uh, asked. Once again, Jim, thank you very much. And we'll go to the film. Hi there, my name's Laurie O'Donnell. I'm delighted to be contributing to this important event on a theme very close to my heart. I'm going to speak to a few slides just to keep me to time and provide a bit of structure. Uh, so Future Skills College opened in June 2017. We're in our fourth year of operation. We've had 90 students completing. Of the 90, 48 have secured full-time apprenticeships in their chosen area. Uh, and at the time of writing, only four haven't yet got a full-time uh, positive destination. Uh, our aims, very broad aims, increasing course choice, bridging the gap between education and employment, especially looking at life in the round, not just getting ready for work. Of course, securing positive destinations, targeting those young people who we think could benefit the most, who've got the biggest distance to travel. And of course, trying to build a model that scales and is sustainable over time. Partnership based to local authorities, a local college, and DC Thompson's Family Trust, Northwood. A number of other partners, but the core ones are at the top. Models dead simple. Start off by recruiting employers with a potential vacancy, then students through a course choice, a secondary school, senior phase, year with us, and then success as they graduate into a full-time apprenticeship. Uh, we've got four themes at the moment, early education and childcare, and three in the construction trades. Um, what are the benefits? Well, students leave school when they're actually leaving school. They attend college full-time and spend one day in placement. Uh, they remain in school roles, so child benefit, bus passes, free school meals, all available. Uh, Qualifications are better integrated into the career choice and, and a number of additional benefits that go along with it. Um, we have some major challenges, pretty much the same as everyone else working with the public sector. Budgetary pressures, difficulty securing funding, especially when you've got big partners like local authorities. Massive challenge scaling up in terms of getting apprenticeships from employers. Uh, and of course, we're trying to do it all in one year. Very, very difficult. Um, so that's my two minutes up. Uh, thank you very much for listening. If you want more information, don't hesitate to get in touch. Okay, thank you very much. Hi, my name is Chloe Williams. I used to work with Mark Pearson from Cyrenians. Um, before I met Mark, I was in fourth year. I failed most exams and courses due to my lack of experience and lack of concentration. The teacher said it was time for me to leave and recommended I see Mark Pearson from Cyrenians. We chatted, got to know each other, and looked at CVs, building a CV up, working, 
towards finding something to do. I worked in a housing association. Mark helped me get on the Jet Plus program. It came to an end after three months of doing different things and it ended in eight. After ending my placement with the housing association, Mark put out a good few words in order to get me another placement with the NHS, which I really enjoyed. After so long, I realised what I really want to do, and that's to be a game developer and create games for the disabled on modern games spectrum. This given them bigger buttons or easier to move, subtitles, audio hearing, just something to help them and hopefully in a few year time I'm running my own company. <laughs> After working with Mark and uh, everything he taught me about gaining confidence, where to look in order to get different placements, just the fun, the laugh, but also the seriousness of building CVs, it was a brilliant help. We need to stop shoehorning young people into a curriculum for design and then blame them when it doesn't meet their needs. The key to engagement is appropriate relationships, skill development and above all flexibility. Is it still appropriate in the 21st century for school for all Monday to Friday 9 to half 3? As a head teacher in my school we developed various pathways and could evidence success in terms of reduced exclusions, better behaviour, increased certification and wider achievement. And we did this in the mid 2000s by focusing on vocational opportunities such as our in-house hospitality academy, flexible timetable arrangements, restorative practice, staged intervention and real partnership with other professionals, colleges, training providers and employers. I can cite examples of young people who became the first in their extended families to complete four years of secondary schooling in our model. In moving into senior leadership in a large local authority, I wanted to extrapolate this approach upwards and create skills academies in schools across the area, ideally one in every locality. I deliberately talk of approach rather than a building or a space, as my philosophy is that the needs of children and young people, whether they're social, emotional, behavioural, learning or physical needs, should be met as close to the community as possible. My approach involves teachers leading learning for and with young people, including achievement and literacy, including digital literacy, numeracy and citizenship. However, it also involves others, youth workers, engineers, plumbers, chefs, mental health counsellors, all who've got knowledge, skills, qualifications and experiences that are valuable for all. This is not a new idea, but it's one that got lost both in the 1999 report Time for Teaching and the 2011 McCormack Review. I'm an optimist and I feel there is a sense of a movement for change gathering in Scotland. My hope for this new year and beyond is that we grasp the nettle and don't suffer from our usual implementation gap, that time from new ideas emerging until there's real change on the ground. Spartans Alternative School and we just want to try and briefly sum up the multitude of varied things that we offer. Um, we take S3s and S4s from mainstream schools who are experiencing or have experienced challenges in their lives and they come to us for part-time alternative education provision. These are young people for whom five days a week, six periods a day in busy classes is just asking for more than they have got to give. 
We are able to offer very much learner-led one-to-one English and maths, lots of sporting activities and creative activities like cookery, art and music. Our staff team are trauma-informed and trauma-skilled and nurture and compassion is at the heart of everything we do here. Uh, mental health therapy is timetabled as part of the day and we partner with you at Bob Scotland, so I'm going to hand over now to Tolga who works with us here. Thanks, Anna. I'm the therapeutic coach, one of them at U of Old Scotland, and we provide mental health provision one to one for young people in North Edinburgh. A really important piece of that work is at the alternative school, where we work with young people who have had multiple difficulties in their lives. And really, the alternative school allows us to nurture them, provide bespoke care for these young people, meet them where they are, and witness after a time the transformational change that this allows. Am I going to ask you, what do you like about coming to Spartans? Uh, the art and the, the football is true, because uh, it's better than what I've done at like, school. It's like one to one, and it's harder. It's easier to do one to one than like in a big class. It's easier to like get more stuff done. What we do with Scran Academy is recognise that education and schooling are not the same thing. The broader approach we need to take with education, with skills building, with life changing services that help young people change their own lives, is recognise a number of very important principles we need to look at and accept if we want to create an education system in Scotland that is truly inclusive for everyone. The first one to recognise is that it's based on relationships, particularly those young people that have had the, the toughest upbringings, that have had to experience trauma in their lives or, or dealing with a multiple um, series of complex issues and barriers in their lives. Relationships are critical. Secondly, we at Scran Academy work to meet young people where they're at. There is no rigid syllable or curriculum or qualifications process that they have to fit into. We very much respond to providing that personal and social development journey, whatever they're at. And the third one that is critical for us is to ensure that young people are part of designing the services and education systems that we all talk about them benefiting from. That's really important. Uh, our success is based as a social enterprise on helping young people realise uh, they can measure themselves and what they have to offer, not just the problems they face, and that's critical. We build relationships with their families, which is really important. We maintain great relationships with their schools, our youth work uh, colleagues in the community sector, as well as well as industry. It's really important. It's about creating a, a culture and a climate of can-dos, and, and they want to get out there and be positive. And we challenge them, but it's important to realise that challenge in an education setting has to come with a level of feeling loved and cared about and believed in as well, um, which is really important. Um, and it's really important for us to recognise that we never change young people's lives. We create the conditions where young people are able to realise they can change their own lives. We don't tell them to find a voice. We help them give themselves permission to use the voice they all already have. And um, in closing, we talk about engaging the disengaged um, it's not as if they chose to be disengaged. We've disengaged them. Therefore, it's our collective duty to make sure that's rectified. And um, It's often not hard to engage people. We just need to go and have the right conversations and connect with them um, in the ways that the ways that really work. Um, and that's, that's most important. Yeah. 
I'm just like so sorry. I'm not kidding. I will be one of the thickest people you'll ever meet. Your folders all there. Courtney's probably been a girl who has not been ignored as such, but she's probably never demanded the extra help that she's possibly needed. Adam, I need you in the library for your reading assessment this period. Courtney, I need you in as well. What does that word say? I'm trying to. Oh my god. Mm, I don't know. That's sure. I just. So do the know. first two. What's first two letters? Oh, Stick or something. Right, so. Oh. Obsess. I can't. Don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Good. <laughs> okay, I'll pause this for you. It's challenging, but it's rewarding at the same time and it's worth the challenge. You are coming up at eight years and two months. Obviously, what are you, 13, 14? 14, 15? You're 15, right, okay, so your reading age is much, much lower than we would expect. Mm -hmm. AG is probably kind of primary four-ish. It's a bit topsy-turvy, I think, working here. It has its moments where I think, oh my God, I want to be able to do better for these guys and I can and then it has its moments where no actually I'm doing amazing for them, I've got them to where they can be. Your behaviour reflects how you feel. If Dimitri's in a class surrounded by his peers and he perceives them to have a desire to see him perform, he'll perform. <laughs> Classroom one just now, please, we're all coming in here. Those of you who are choosing to wear trousers as part of the uniform know fine well we do not accept sports gear, joggies or anything as part of the uniform. Oh, because you couldn't remember yeah, yeah, uniform. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I couldn't put yesterday's aside. Right, when he's in a car with me, I'm his primary audience. Jump in. What do I need? I need a conversation from him. If I started berating him in the car for having the wrong trousers on, he would close up because he would start to feel under attack. That hill there is where my son learned to do hill starts for his driving test. Yeah. I told him if he could do a hill start on that hill, he can do a hill start on any hill. That is. These trips, we do it because it's part of the theory of sweating the small stuff. If we sweat the small stuff, um, the big stuff doesn't become an issue. Spot on. Ironed with a crease you could slice tomatoes with. Well, a fascinating insight into some of the most inspiring projects uh, and also obviously the some of the young people who are benefiting from it and um, we're, we're, um, we're going to move on to uh, Q and a Q&A now um, and basically all the people you saw there or the, the adults certainly are with us today and if I could ask if you were in one of the videos there if you could unmute yourself because uh, I'd like to, you to join in the questions and actually if you want to nip in and answer something because we're not getting very many questions that are uh, focused on one particular individual please please do jim I, I might just start with you there's a few questions obviously linked into to, to newlands um just a, a sort of double header here how, how were the young people approached to uh to, to to go to the college was it how were they selected at what point were they selected and is there an understanding of the the moment that kids become disengaged and you know what are we doing enough to address that perhaps between primary and secondary you know that's a very difficult transition so when do when do we what do we know about when kids become disengaged and then how do you go about identifying and, and recruiting the the ones that will really benefit the um the feedback we got from head teachers was towards the end of second year uh, secondary school they started to, they, they could identify those that were going to disengage. Um, so, you know, that we were focused on third and fourth year, taking them out for third and fourth year and giving this alternative curriculum. Sorry about the noise in the background. Someone's decided to drill, but hopefully you can still hear me. Um, so um, we the way we selected them was we, we engaged with the, the teachers of the secondary school, the head teachers, to identify individuals that they thought would benefit from the kind of approach we were taking. So they're all nominated by the schools. Um, 
except you know a few who got to find out through social workers that talked to each other that um, you know that this would be a good perhaps a good solution for the young person so some of it was um, initiated by social workers as well but uh, it was mainly uh, working very closely with the schools that we we identified the young people that could benefit from the input. And why why do you think um, that this can't be or isn't being done within mainstream schooling? What 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 what's the benefit to taking these children out of the school that they're they're in, away from their classmates, and and treating them differently in a different environment? Could it and should it be done within the mainstream school, or do you think it's better to take them out? I think there's no way it'll work within the mainstream school. You know, that's the key here. You have to take them out into their own environment. We're talking about 20% of statutory leavers, probably across Scotland, and even evidence from outside of Scotland. It's the same statistic. In Connecticut in the USA, I, I read uh, a report about similar statistic, 20% who, who just disengage. Um, so you have to treat these people in a different way. And we've heard from many of the speakers that it's about nurture. It's about giving these people the right to, to respect themselves. You know, we, we it was mentioned earlier, um, they don't disengage. We disengage them from the system and we need, they deserve to be supported in a different way. And we have to do it. You know, some, something needs to change. Yeah, I, want, I wonder if I could uh, ask the next question of someone from Cyrenians or Future Skills College or, or uh, 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 Scran Academy or any of those guys. Um, a few questions come in about how we avoid simply replicating the old junior, senior, secondary school system and how you provide parity of esteem for kids who end up in alternative approaches. So I guess that's something that a lot of parents would worry about. We used to worry about it when we still had the junior and senior schooling. Would someone talk a bit to that, please? Um, and just, just talk if it's... Yeah, if so it's I, mean, I, I can answer a bit from our, our perspective in Cyrenians is that part of that is embedding our staff within the school. So the, 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 it's, not a, it's not something you go somewhere else for in that sense. The first engagement you have is with somebody in the, in the school context. Although a lot of the people that we're, um, we also deal with are school refusers. So we then go to the house um, and, and that um, we'll chat the door and we'll keep doing. And that stickability um, becomes, um, it becomes crucial. Um, so we've understood from the school where the issue is, and then we go and we're chapping our door and keeping going back and keeping going back and then talking with the whole family as part of that, as, as part of that solution. And so the relationship is built with us. Um, and, and the young person is saying, well, actually, this is a place I want to be rather than worrying about how it's, it's viewed by the, the school it's, uh, or, or, or the peers because they're succeeding. And because they're celebrating they're succeeding, they're then saying, this is good rather than I'm here because I failed. And, and therefore, they define how it's perceived um, and they're, they're in control of how it's perceived mm -hmm. um, because it's built on that relationship. It's not to a place, it's a relationship. Yeah, maybe I can just add to, to you and point there kind of starting points, not a deficit. Yeah. So, and the young person, so if it's, uh, they're not there because they've failed at school. They're there because school's not provided them with uh, the opportunities that are, that are best suited to them. So um, for our young people, it's a fresh start and they, they embrace it. Um, school hasn't worked for them. We're slightly different cohort than, than Jim was dealing with at Newlands. Ours are a bit older, but they, they're, they're kind of still at school, but they're they're not going to leave with a lot of qualifications and they're kind of hanging on at school because they don't know what else to do with their lives. So they come to us, self-selected through course choice, of course with guidance teachers and the like involved. But um, once they join us, it's that fresh start and that's what gives them that motivation to, to um, yeah, not feel like they're, they're at some sort of, um, uh, that there's some deficiency on their part. They've just not found the right opportunity so far in their life, and this is it. So they embrace it. Can I just say that, um, you know, on the comment between the junior, junior secondary and um, senior secondaries, um, uh, that used to split people out at uh, year one. So you got, you got streamed uh, first year of secondary into junior secondary. Um, what, 
the reason we called this a junior college is we didn't want the stigma of a special school. So what we're saying is after two years, you probably get the best you're going to get out of the secondary school system because they're not engaging with you the way you, you, you need to be engaged with. So you then move on to a junior college. You, you know, it's, it's a step between school and college and it's more vocationally oriented. So I think, you know, it's, it's different from the old um, sort of junior secondary, senior secondary. And I think one of the problems when we moved to comprehensive education was it wasn't comprehensive. It pushed all the people that got the kind of training that they needed in a junior secondary into an academic curriculum that they really weren't all suited for. So it wasn't comprehensive. It, it, it was under the, the pretext that it was equality of opportunity and, it, and I, I don't think it was. Can I just say something, Jim, there about on the kind of academic vocational thing? We've, we've never had any problems with people becoming medics or, or doctors or lawyers. And they go through a highly vocational education. The challenge with vocational versus academic is that the, the, the work-related stuff uh, came with a status. And, and we need to break that as well. I think one of the challenges in the secondary school is to become factories for qualifications. So the SQA demands kick in far too early and success in secondary school is how well you can do in SQA qualifications and progress to university. And those who are not going to university get left behind. Um, so that you're absolutely spot on. Comprehensive schools aren't comprehensive. They tend to be filters, um, pathways to universities and that's what success looks like. And we need to break that. Just moving on to another, there, there's a few questions about outdoor education centres, which I think we're probably all aware of, have become something of a, a bugbear for the, the Scottish government and, and the, the funding of these places. Um, uh, you know, so, as it says, outdoor education can, for a very modest investment has a huge return. And what is the cost of not investing in initiatives like outdoor education, but also the kind of uh, things that, that you guys are, are doing? Um, I suppose, do, do you feel supported by government do you think are you taken seriously are you regarded as a place that's a kind of free hit to take kids who aren't succeeding in mainstream education and therefore you know i presume the school's exam results go up because you take some of the kids that aren't that are going to drag those results down um what, what's your experience with government and the support that they're giving you uh whether it's financial whether it's uh you know just support across the whole possible range of things, that, that, again, to anyone that's involved in these projects? I, I mean, I would say that, the, that you have to see the, the, the relationship with um, the public sector rather than government uh, in particular is, um, you know, we've got very good relationships with schools. Um, we're in virtually every high school in Edinburgh and um, we have real relationships because we, we understand we're working on a common task, which is how do you help young people flourish? Um, and so in that sense, there's great support. When it comes to funding, however, it is a it is a it's a much bigger challenge, um, and that's partly because of the pressures that, um, uh, particularly local government, is under at the moment. Um, and I, I that's the one thing, and amongst all the positive stuff that we're going to talk about today, I see the, the biggest challenge, um, because it is through local government as that facilitator that we can um, make the difference. We can't do this centrally; it just cannot be delivered centrally. Um, uh, you know, uh, there are, all the evidence would say that designing things locally is is how you get the best of what that locality can bring. Um, but the capacity for local government at present to be in a conversation um, uh, about this kind of creativity is hugely limited because their entire brain, state, brain space has been taken up and not just with COVID but just with cuts that are coming beforehand with survival um, and frankly having been inside local government it is very hard um, I, I, I can tell you that this is not a, a new phenomenon but it is much worse than it was when I was involved 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, okay um, um, well, we've got another couple of opportunities uh, later on for, for questions, so I'm just going to keep things moving because we're running a bit behind schedule. Uh, I'm now going to ask uh, Professor Lindsay Patterson of Edinburgh University to, to join us and just maybe to reflect a bit on what we've heard so far in the spotlight. And, and, and I guess uh, after that, we'll maybe have a five minute break just for a, a toilet break or, or, or whatever. But Lindsay, if you just want to reflect on, on what we've had, we've heard so far uh, 
and what your take on it all is. Thanks, Chris. And yes, an absolutely fascinating debate. I'm reflecting on this from the point of view of what I do, which is research and therefore the international research on these questions. And I would emphasize, of course, here that research is only quite a small part of understanding the experiences that we've heard of today and the policies that might come into to play. But nevertheless, I do think it is one very useful way because it shows what can work and what might have to be done in order to make it work. And I would emphasize again, please put questions and comments and criticisms and fundamental disagreements with what I'm saying into the chat function. And then Chris will put these questions to me after the five minute break, which will follow what I'm saying. So I've got four points to make. The first point is a bit of context. Despite everything that we have heard so far, and despite all the well-known problems of Scottish education, we are actually far better now at catering for a very diverse range of students than we have ever been doing, as Ewan, in fact, has pointed out. In 2019, for example, just 2.2% of students left with minimal formal qualifications. That's a thousand people whom the schools are not serving well at all, and is the very reason ultimately for this event today. But just a decade ago, it wasn't a thousand, it was 1,500 or 2.8%. In the mid-1970s, it was 50% leaving without any formal recognised record of what they had done at school. And in the post-war period, it was 90%. And there are similar trends of gradual improvement for the percentages of people not going to positive destinations, as they're now called. Now, this trend of massive improvement reminds us that policy can achieve things because the main reason for the improvement was comprehensive secondary schooling and the development of a common curriculum for everyone. But these positive trends also raise a more sobering thought, which is of greater relevance to today. If you left school with no qualifications in 1950 or the 1970s, you were not alone. Very many of your fellow students were in the same position. In the 1950s, there were numerous opportunities to take courses and apprenticeships. Even in the fairly dire economic circumstances for youth unemployment in the 1980s, the very scale of the challenge provoked much policy debate, some of it in fact leading to the school curricular developments that I've just mentioned. But now, the thousand young people who leave school with no formal qualifications are not the focus of extensive public national policy debate. And so that's one historically important reason why the kinds of alternative provision that we're talking about today are so important. A statistically small minority can all too easily be cast out of mind. My second point is about what we as teachers have to do. The recurrent word already so far today has been relationships, but there's also the equal importance of responsibility of what Philip Graham of Newlands College called sweating the small things and of teachers providing a model of adult responsibility. This discussion reminds me of a comment by Catherine Burville Singh, the charismatic head of Macaulay Academy in London, a comprehensive school that has recently had striking success in enabling disaffected students to overcome numerous racial and socioeconomic barriers. Burville Singh has repeatedly said that what matters is understanding the importance of responsibility for one's own life. The improving inclusiveness of Scottish schools between the 1960s and the present has been in large part through the gradually increasing respect with which teachers treat students, which in turn encourages students into an ethic of responsibility. The third of my comments from research is on the curriculum. There's a tendency in British debate about disaffection from school to imagine that the answer is the narrow kind of skills training which tends to pass for vocational education in Britain. And there's actually another example of that in the paper on FE colleges that's been issued for England today by the Department for Education in London. But the gold standard of vocational education internationally is in Germany, where vocational preparation goes far beyond specific skills. It includes more general education than even our core school curriculum does in Scotland. It gives all students, German, mathematics, English, natural sciences, geography, history, aesthetic subjects and sport. And remember that's the vocational curriculum in German vocational schools. And this is then another feature that is striking about the, the diverse alternative provision which we've heard about today. We heard how Spartans Academy gives attention to English and maths as well as sport and personal growth. Scran and Cyrenian seek to develop the full personality of their students, not just their employability. And as Jim McCall described, Newlands combined these core features of general education with preparation for apprenticeship. Which then brings me to my final point at the moment, which is to ask what a vocation is. 
When vocation is reduced to skills training, the word comes to mean just getting something that pays a wage. But Chloe Williams, who described her placement with Sirenians as changing her life, said that the opportunity gave her something meaningful to do with her life. The striking tone, in fact, from all the young people who were interviewed in the films was a sense of purpose which they had. And purpose is not just personal meaning, of course, the personal sense of fulfillment, which all these young people have explained to us. It's also a social meaning, the sense of paid work, for example, as a social contribution, not just a source of a wage, whether that's repairing someone's car or caring for a child. Or there is a sense of civic purpose embodied in Ross MacArthur's engagement uh, with the Youth Parliament. So these are my four reflections so far today on what has been achieved by these remarkable alternative providers of opportunities to learn. First, being profoundly disaffected from school is all the more invidious because of the sheer success of Scottish education in integrating the majority. Second, success in this educational work depends on deep mutual respect between students and teachers. Third, the curriculum of a successful vocational programme, if it is to stimulate the full flowering of each student's potential, must include the full range of human accomplishment, not merely the skills needed to get a job. And fourth, a vocation is more than just a job. It's a contribution to social well-being. So that's me finished for just now. As Chris said, we're now going to take a five minute break. You can still submit comments and questions via chat during the break, and Chris will put these to me when we resume. And there are... So, uh... One thing that's been mentioned, and it is a good, a good point, is that is high school not too late to intervene with some of these children and an earlier intervention, as early as possible really, would stand a much better chance of you know, preventing maybe them going down the path that they've gone down already. What, what's your uh, thoughts on, on that? Absolutely. Uh, most things would be far better, and education would be far better started at very early ages. And if we could get that right, that would be much better. It is important to emphasise we're getting more of that right now than we used to do, but we still are not getting it all right. And the problem is, of course, I doubt if we will ever get it all right. So it is always going to have been necessary to have various ways of compensating, rescuing people is a word that's come up in the chat, um, giving people alternative new later opportunities. I mean, after all, if you think about it this way, if we could get it all right by the end of primary school, then you could put people safely and predictably onto paths that would lead them into a fulfilling, successful adulthood and careers. But of course, we know from the, the failures of the selective system before contract education that we never can get it right as, uh, by the age of 11 or 12. But it's always going to, there are always going to be people who take longer to, cut, to, to reach particular points and who need further support. So yes, more and more intervention at an early age, especially preschool actually, is absolutely crucial, especially in matters like reading, for example, which is the key to everything else. But but we still have to have ways in which people that don't take these opportunities for whatever reason manage to come back in and re-engage later on. What, what would that earlier intervention look like? You mentioned reading, so how, how, how would you see a structure in place that uh, would meet the demand for, a, for an earlier programme that would make a difference? There are good examples of this. Renfrewshire, for example, has done some really brilliant work actually, um, looking at the getting early intervention with children, getting them to read, uh, to take reading seriously, to see reading as a key to absolutely everything. Um, and to be fair, I think there is a political consensus in Scotland now uh, that reading is the key to everything else that happens. Uh, and that in order to get children reading, there has to be work with parents. Uh, not, so it's not just in school, it's also working with parents. It truly is a, is, a, is a partnership. So there is progress there and we are doing a lot better in that respect too than we ever did before. But the point is, of course, sustaining it. And the key thing here, in fact, is reading for enjoyment and getting people to read for enjoyment is not something that you can mandate. Certainly no policymaker can, can produce a policy that induces people to enjoy reading. You've got to be a JK Rowling to create something that enables people to enjoy reading. But it's that, all the research internationally as well as in Britain and in Scotland, which shows that enjoying reading is, is, is the biggest single thing actually that leads to success in education throughout the school years. Hmm. We, we were talking the other day to a, a lawyer who, a criminal lawyer who um, has come to uh, a view on, on the impact that trauma has on creating offenders, young offenders, what of trauma earlier in life, abuse, that, that, that kind of thing. Um, and some people are talking here about whether teachers should be better trained in, in dealing with trauma and, and other issues. Is that is that something that you think would 
be of benefit. Well, I'm, 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 I've got there's some very good research done by colleagues. I'm not an expert in this, but by colleagues at Edinburgh University, Professor Susan McVie, for example, and her team there on on the way in which uh, you can sadly often detect the the, the ways in which um, criminality builds up. Uh, from a very early age indeed, and often from trauma. So certainly trauma is a crucial thing. Um, the one thing I would, however, say here is that we, we keep on, we have a tendency in, in, in society to keep on imposing more and more things on teachers and expecting teachers to solve the, every social problem that ever crops up. That simply can't be done, not just because no human being can do it all. You, you, you need specialist psychological and other expertise, social work exp expertise to deal with trauma. But also because if you if, if we expect teachers to deal with all these things, then they have no time left to teach. And after all, the core purpose of a teacher is to teach things, is to teach knowledge, is to get young people to engage with knowledge. That's not pretending that knowledge is everything. Of course, it's not everything. But teachers have that specialist function in society to pass on knowledge, which no other professional in society has. The professionals that engage with trauma are the people that are specialised, that, that have experience and knowledge and expertise in that particular area. Okay. And the last question for now um, is that why are schools so rigid is it, is it the council is it a lack of imagination is the problem one of size that is too big or too small or whatever um, there's lots of answers but the, the one i would give which i think shows how difficult it is the more standardized and sadly the more rigid a system is the wider the range of opportunities that can be provided it's through a standardised national curriculum, for example, that we have opened up opportunities to social groups that previously never had of these opportunities before. If you look back historically, that's the way in which girls and young women got equal opportunities, in which Catholics in Scotland got opportunities, in which gradually people of low socioeconomic background got opportunities as well. It's through standardisation. And even it has to be said too, the bigger the secondary school, the better the opportunities they offer. Um, that, that's a problem because of course that also, as we've heard today, the bigger the secondary school, the more potentially alienating it is for the minority who don't engage. Now that is an unresolvable contradiction and there is no easy to answer to that. If we create lots of small secondary schools, we restrict opportunity. If we have big secondary schools, we make them alienating. There is no really easy way of, of approaching that particular challenge. But it's not standardization, uh, rigid structures, if you like to call them that, are not inevitably a problem. In fact, they can be part of the solution in providing equal opportunities. Okay, well, th thank you for that, Lindsay, and thanks to uh, everyone who has sent in questions so far, and, and especially those who've given us such uh, interesting answers. We're now going to move on to our third film, uh, and it's called A Principal's Perspective, and it's an interview uh, or a conversation between Ian White, who's the head teacher of Newlands Junior College, and uh, Ewan Aiken, the ubiquitous Ewan Aiken. Um, Catherine, if you want to. In the 20 years and one week that I was the, the governor he day, um, we really moved the school forward and we had an emphasis on meeting the needs and aspirations of every single child that came to the place, whether they were aspiring to a university career or whether they were aspiring to enter directly into the world of work. And the real bottom line for us was uh, as far as we possibly could to get every young person that left us into a positive destination. Why, why make that move from the mainstream to uh, to the experimental? Newlands Junior College uh, seemed to me to be a place that was it was catering for young people that the mainstream, for whatever reason, didn't suit, and yet they were talented with uh, a je ne sais quoi, uh, a spark. So what what was it? about um, Newlands, if, if you call it, let's call it a safety net. Um, what, what, what made up that safety net? I think the most important thing would be um, building the relationships with the young people that are really, really positive so that mutual trust develops. I really have five big players in terms of the success in Newlands. The relationships thing, the culture of the organisation that we develop, not by accident, but by visioning and a deliberate approaches. The people in the team, the people that I recruited, all had to have it in here. A belief in young people. Um, you know, um, 
they talk about unconditional love, unconditional belief in young people that all of them can achieve and that all of them have talents in there uh, somewhere. Uh, the trust thing and our links with partners start and finish with the parents and carers. Start and finish with them. And also with uh, City of Glasgow College in particular, the Arnold Clark's training arm who worked on the vocational courses with our young people. Are there other things that you would say that you'd learn from Newlands that Scottish education could learn from? The way that it operated at Newlands, um, I knew exactly what the expectations of me and the team were. We had to deliver them and we did. And the accountability was quarterly trustee meetings where I had to provide a, a progress report a week or so beforehand and then uh, we talked through the progress report on the day of the trustee meeting. Now, the interesting thing is you in the, under that, under that regime, I felt infinitely more accountable than I ever had in the local authority system. Do, is the problem then, do you think, that, that that kind of culture change just takes longer than five years? I sincerely and firmly believe after 40 odd years in the wacky world of Scottish education, that if the culture in schools were to change and move in the Newlands type direction, uh, the need for these places would be uh, would be much, much, much uh, reduced. Okay, well, that's another interesting uh, film, and interesting, especially to hear from uh, the man who was who was running Newlands. Uh, next, uh, we are going to hear from. Keir Bloomer. Uh, Keir is uh, Chair of Reform Scotland's Commission on School Reform and uh, a wise old hand in Scottish education. Uh, and I think Keir's going to talk to us a bit about some of the data that's been gathered about the, the impact Newlands has made, so putting some numbers behind the, the arguments. Uh, so over to you, Keir. Thank you, Chris. The Newlands client group was the disengaged. It didn't include the most challenging young people with severe behavioural difficulties, but it was entirely made up of a group who seemed to be headed for failure. Uh, disadvantage was not one of the admissions criteria for Newlands, but in practice, and this is not surprising, 70% of students came from the lowest quintile in the Scottish Index of Multiple Deprivation. The aim was obviously to give people a good start in life a positive destination. And that positive destination was set more stringently than the Scottish Government does. We did not consider insecure, low paid, dead end employment to be a positive destination. The curriculum had three main strands, a reduced academic curriculum focused on fundamental skills and on practical and vocationally useful subjects, as Jim described earlier. A substantial element of personal development aimed at cultivating self-confidence, resilience, and which also used a wide array of awards in order to give people the experience of success. And the third element was vocational education, comprising also, of course, work experience, but mainly made up of vocational courses run in partnership with the City of Glasgow College, a very fine partnership it was, and also increasingly with a course run by GTG, the training arm of Arnold Clark, which was one of the industrial partners of Newlands Junior College. There was also a principal teacher who was responsible for business links, careers and guidance, and who developed a very significant, what you might describe as after sales service, keeping in touch with ex-students and giving them the positive support to stay in their destinations. As has been described, it was a junior college, not called a school. It was located in a place of work and its appearance was very different. It provided a great deal of wraparound care, transport, meals, 
and all of the things that contributed to being a caring community. And in that sense, small size was critically important. The kind of relationships and ethos that Newlands developed could not have been created in a mainstream setting with a thousand or more pupils. The effect, as you've heard, was improved attendance and attitude, very few behavioural difficulties, an ethos of success, unexpected levels of success in qualifications, and of course, almost all finishers entering further education courses, apprenticeships, or worthwhile employment. The cost was about £15,000 uh, per pupil, which is significantly above the state school average spend, but actually that £15,000 in each of two years is no more than would be spent on those people who stay on in the state sector to S5 and S6. Uh, and of course, there was a very substantial saving which society will realise over many years yet to come because educational failure is positively correlated, well, I should really say negatively correlated, uh, with a whole range of other adverse factors with criminality, with poor health, contact with the criminal justice system, uh, and of course, uh, unemployment, which means no tax take and so on. So the massive benefit yet to accrue is both in human terms and in economic terms. What of course stands out now as very striking is that this was a hugely successful experiment, which did not survive beyond its initial five years, despite sustained support from the Scottish government. It was not accepted into the mainstream thinking of Scottish education and that failure casts doubt on the system's ability to innovate. We can now look at a film showing a discussion involving people involved in NJC from a variety of perspectives, including those of parent and student. Catherine, could you please show the film? And as it goes on... Ian Aiken, I'm the Chief Executive of Cyrenians. We're a homelessness charity based in the East Coast of Scotland. Um, I've visited uh, Newlands, but also as a politician at one time, responsible for education in some small way. Welcome to this uh, panel. We're trying to get what might be described as the, um, the lived experience of uh, Newlands from a, a whole number of perspectives, from parent and student and staff and trustee. Um, we've got a, an amazing range of folk to tell us about what it was like for them and how they believe that it could be like for others. Hello, um, my name is Carla Gethin and I'm a Newlands Junior College Board of Trustees member. I work closely with the team when NJC was founded in 2014 to identify a range of technical and vocational curriculum options from the City of Glasgow College for Newlands Junior College students. I'm Alex Stewart. I was the Deputy Chairman of Newlands Junior College, a trustee. Um, I also had the privilege of helping with a couple of the personal development classes at Newlands and mentoring some of the students. My name is Philip Graham. I was the deputy principal of Newlands Junior College. Uh, I was also the IT teacher and worked with uh, some of the fine young people there. Hi, I'm Linda MacArthur. Uh, my son Ross attended Newlands from 2017 to graduation 2019. Hi, I'm Eden Harley. Um, I graduated in 2017. Um, I currently now work with Arnold Clark and Customer Services. Hi, I'm Ross MacArthur. MacArthur. I was a student at Newlands uh, from 2017 to 2019 uh, and I'm currently working in customer services for Arnold Clark. Beginning with you Philip because you I um, understand were one of the kind of founders of uh, um, Newlands. You came from what would be described as um, the, the mainstream education. What made you make that move? For me I think it was uh, it was what people uh, parochially call it a no-brainer um, and I know it, it doesn't it doesn't seem a typical no-brainer because it was, you know, for want of a better expression, I was already in a comfortable uh, city council job. Um, I had all the usual securities and comforts and uh, associated uh, safety of a, a city council job. But uh, working with Ian, I had got rather used to uh, his, let's just say, maverick style and approach. And uh, when uh, he, he was working on the Newlands project, it just sounded like all the kind of things that we wanted to do, but again, uh, 
we weren't allowed to do it uh, in so many circumstances. So when you're told, right, see all these things that we try to do and try to, for want of a better expression, get away with in mainstream education for the benefit of the young people, we're now going to be able to do something for real. What were some of those things that you, you weren't allowed to do that you became allowed to do? And did they work? We, we had all these kind of daft ideas, crazy ideas, for example, I remember the, the one that sticks in my head most was when Ian called me into his office and he said, what would a school that didn't have rules look like? <laughs> and of course, my, my remit in my previous job was uh, discipline and behaviour management. So, you know, after I stopped foaming at the mouth for a bit, I said, no, don't be ridiculous, in a school without rules, that can't possibly. And then he said, no, wait a wee minute. He said, we uh, govern children with rules at school and in teacher training college. It's the first thing teachers are told to be terrified about, behaviour management and discipline. Uh, well, funnily enough, in England, they call it behaviour management. In Scotland, we still call it discipline. But uh, I, I sort of toyed with the idea of this chaos and he said, uh, no, he said, let's think about it. When they leave school and they go and get a job, uh, what, apart from health and safety rules, are they actually told about the rules? He said, what we want is a school just built on culture, built on the idea that you get in a family where you don't have necessarily rules in your family, but everyone in your family knows oh, this is the way we do things in our house. So he wanted to build a school that was based on this is the way we do things around here. Eden, did that sense of being in a place without rules, um, was, that, was that really what it felt like and did it work for you? It definitely worked. It made things a lot more flexible, um, a lot more at ease, um, just with the whole perception of going to college. The fact that there wasn't so much rules, we didn't even get in trouble as much, but it made you kind of rely on yourself more to do the right things rather than other people making you do the right things. So I think that benefited me a lot more than it did at the mainstream education. How did you work out what the right thing was to do? When you go to mainstream education, you do something maybe wrong, you get in trouble for it. But when it came to New Orleans College, you would just have a, they would, they would speak to you, they wouldn't give any trouble, um, which would then make, make the relationship grow a lot more um, because it just had a simple conversation that um, MDLs would have with you rather than that divide where it's a teacher student divide. Um, it was a lot more on the same level with the teachers and um, you felt a lot more comfortable with them. So a lot of it was down to that relationship? Yeah, or most of it. I'd say maybe 80% of it was down to that. So Carla, you come from a, 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 an, an education institution background. Um, institution is perhaps a pejorative word, I don't mean it, I mean it like that, but it's organised in, in a traditional way. Um, why, what, what made you get into this? The main thing that attracted me to the Newlands Junior College model was that there was an alternative pathway to students for one reason or another that perhaps mainstream education hadn't been working for them. But it was really the key thing for me was the recognition the role of vocational education could play alongside the academic curriculum at Newlands Junior College to equip young people with the skills that they would need for employment and that would be valued by employers. Do you think there is an, an, an issue though about how we value vocational over against academic? That was the key thing that attracted me was the opportunity to blend that academic curriculum, building those knowledge and skills through the practical application of skills. So that was certainly a big attraction for me that, you know, because I see many, many students graduate with academic qualifications with employers telling us as a college, they don't have the actual skill set that we need to allow them to be effective in the workplace. For example, communication, working with others, team working, and that's what the college education allowed to add value to that academic <sighs> curriculum. What, what was it that made you think it would be good for Ross? Ross had went from being an extremely um, able academically and confident child in primary school to very rapidly changing in secondary school to a boy who to be honest, we didn't recognise. It, it felt like a lifeline, to be honest. That's where I really thought this could really be the thing that saves my son's future. And it turned out it was. You, you felt it was that significant? Even going, going to the interview and I said, I feel as if my son's going to seriously slip through the net and I really worry about his future, his future to even obtain or hold on to employment. Um, and within weeks, of Ross going to Newlands, Ross was transformed. And I know for a fact that we owe 
Ross's future and how Ross is now to everybody who was involved in Newlands because if it wasn't for Newlands my son wouldn't be where he is today. Can you tell us a bit more about the actual interview itself? It was quite relaxed, it was quite calm for the most part. Um, yeah, it, it was just a sort of get to know you, am I suitable for the college um, and do I buy into the idea and, and I did. And what did it mean buying into the idea? Taking responsibility for my own education, that's what Newland's done, it gave you self-confidence and it put responsibility onto the kids and, and young people who before Newlands didn't take much responsibility from themselves, I don't think. Why did you buy into the idea of Newlands? At the beginning, I said no to Jim. I said to him, what, what do we know about education? Uh, why should we as a business get involved in education? And was uh, uh, persuaded by Jim to get involved. I have to say, though, that I'm glad he persuaded me. And I think it's one of the most rewarding experiences in my whole work life I've been involved in. Um, because what I've got the opportunity to see was the relationships that developed between the teachers and the young people and the belief in each other and, and, and the, the willingness to go the extra mile for each other was just amazing. And in the first six weeks of each year, I would say, oh gosh, we've been lucky in the previous year or the previous two years or the previous three years. We've got a bunch of rowdy kids that are going to, uh, uh, are going to rip this place up maybe. And it was always transformational how when that relationship was seemed to be real, that the, that the young people and the adults believed in each other and it moved forward every single year. How did you manage that relationship between business and education? I think traditionally or historically, schools and teachers are afraid to ask business. They're slightly nervous. They think they're being presumptuous, not realizing that if you look at it through the eyes of business, it's very much in everyone's interests to talk. So part of the part of the setup of Newlands gave us a tremendous insight into leadership and management of business. So it, it immediately allowed us to see the way things top business people look at and examine and evaluate uh, problems and situations. For example, uh, when we trained new members of staff in how to communicate with young people positively and uh, productively. I've done this for years with teachers and many parts of it are controversial. When I sat down with Alec to provide the same training to him as the, as the Deputy Chair of the Board of Trustees, I, I think he nearly was asleep at one point because he was saying, sorry, I'm not getting what's controversial about this. This is how people in business communicate. So, you know, you keep telling me this is a, you know, this is a hot potato. Uh, and he said, it's, it's really not. Eden and Ross, um, of all the things you did at, at Newlands, um, what, what would the one thing that you th you would think was most um, most valuable to you? It's not so much a single thing that I've done at Newlands, but it's it's how it developed me and allowed me to do other things with my life. Um, just, you know, things that I'm involved in now, I would never have even thought of um, back before Newlands. Like, Know, speaking in the House of Commons as a member of the Youth Parliament, like that's not something that I should be doing. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, it's not something that I would have done before in Newlands. Um, we started a football podcast. Well, it might have seemed like a bit of fun at the time. It gave you the confidence that you could speak in front of an audience. Now I've got my own podcast. I've interviewed them MPs. Um, yeah, it just it's just grown me as a person. I don't think there's a single thing that I could point to, but it's just what I've actually gained out of it uh, as me. The best thing is just how it developed you. Maybe it made you how you look at life a lot different um, and you value things more because, like Rossi's mum said, I feel the same, so a lifeline. If I just stayed, stayed at school, I don't really know where I would be right now. Um, it's not a nice thought to think of where you could have been. Um, so it's just the opportunity that it gave you and how much it better you as a person. Um, it made you actually just, it's just hard to put it because it's just, you feel like you're always just caught up in the moment and you still just can't believe that all these opportunities have came. When there was a tipping point for Ross? I would say by September, we had seen a complete change in Ross as a person. So that was only within, I'd say within the space of a month. And Ross had totally changed. He spoke again in the house, which he'd stopped doing. Um, and I think, 
what they call it in Newlands family, and that's what it was. It was like a family, and there was no barriers. And I think, I think it's a tragic shame that it's not there because it is, it does transform kids' lives. It really does. Carla, just to you finally, did your experience with Newlands help change your? education institution? It most definitely did. I mean, I think one of the things that, that was wonderful for, for myself and obviously the team at City who delivered was to take part in the graduation ceremonies each year, which were truly rewarding and humbling. And it was recognising that the barriers that these young people had faced and that they'd gone on to achieve their academic and vocational curriculum. And that, that allowed our lecturers to review how they viewed learning and teaching to recognise that not everybody is coming from the same background and how can they have a positive impact on a young person's life. And it was with great pride at those graduation ceremonies that I thought that we had a part to play in the success of these young people. I think that's, that, that's a, a really good point to, fin to finish on. It is, it's all about who is before me and what journey can I go with them? Okay, so an interesting insight across the whole range of participants in, in Newlands there and um, the, the fact that it's not still running, I think you can see from the, the young people who benefited there, um, means there are young people who would be benefiting now who are no longer new cohorts and, and the rest of it. And that, I guess, is something that we should think about, not just in terms of Newlands, but all the projects that we've we've seen here. Um, Keir, there, there's a variety of complementary opportunities that we're hearing about Today. How do you build a system where different approaches complement each other rather than compete with one another? And, and how do you build a system where there are enough of these uh, projects that enough of the children who need access to them are getting them? For example, I wrote a piece for the Press and Journal ahead of today's conference about the subject and they asked me, because they're in Aberdeen, could you put in a local project and I couldn't find one. I couldn't find anything north of Dundee. I'm sure it probably exists, but I, I couldn't find it. So, you know, there's a lot of central belt activity going on here, but perhaps not more broadly across Scotland. So how do you build that structure if it's not to be done by central government and is to be done by innovators and, and social entrepreneurs? Unfortunately, we presently have a system which is very hostile to innovation and we require changes in governance to rectify that situation. The Scottish Government's embracing of the idea of school autonomy and empowerment was a step in the right direction, but actually very little has been done to follow it up. The trouble is that Scottish education is controlled by a group of essentially consenting elites uh, in local government, in national agencies and in teacher trade unions. And until they can be dislodged from their current preeminence, progress is going to be very limited and very slow. And that is going to call for courage that government has so far not shown. It supported Newlands Junior College and I absolutely applaud them for that, but its record of supporting innovation, especially divergent innovation, is very weak. And I suppose that then leads me on to my next question, my last one for now. How, how do we push the ideas and, and the radical things that are on display here today so that they will reach more people? How do we create a political and educational culture that will be more open to, to different ideas? That could be to anyone who would like to answer. I mean, uh, Lindsay, do you want to pick up on that? Did you hear the question? Um, Yes, I did. I, I, perhaps I could incorporate that to save a little bit of time here. I can incorporate it into my final reflective comments in a few minutes. Would that be OK? Just yes, of course. Save a bit of time. Well, yeah, uh -huh. Thank you. That, that's fine. So, well, shall we just move on to that now then? Because we are running uh, a bit over schedule. So I don't know if you just want to... OK, right. Yes, so we are running a bit of schedule. So I'm not going to go back through the points I made earlier. I want to finish with a, essentially a policy point. How do we get this into the political discussion, especially since we're facing an election um, if, if not in May, then certainly sometime during this calendar year. Now, I think that if there's one thing that we can learn from the rich display of examples that we have seen today is that we need to scale it up. It needs to happen across the country and it needs to also be an alternative provision that's available to people not to perhaps who are at risk of dropping out, but who have not yet done so. That's perhaps a group that is extremely difficult to measure. But of course, we only see them once they've sadly actually left the mainstream system or dis disengaged from it. 
Now, it seems to me that the policy conditions that led to the educational success of Newlands are not commonly found in Scottish education. And I think the same can be said for the achievements of the other providers of alternative education that we've heard from today. Now, I think there's many specific lessons for policy and policy makers that we could learn from, but in the time available, I'm just going to focus on one, perhaps the most controversial of all. It's the importance of properly challenging partnership, not just partnership, but challenging partnership. Newlands was a partnership, as we've heard, of commercial industry such as Clyde Bullard and Arnold Clark, voluntary sector support and local authority funding and advice. Now, we're not very good at that sort of thing in Scottish education. Any involvement of the private sector, such as Clyde Bloors, Jim McCall and Alex Stewart, any involvement of the private sector in schooling is regarded in Scotland with deep suspicion. And even the voluntary sector is generally kept at arm's length from the rather complacent consensus that policy tends to surround itself in Scotland in relation to public services of all kinds. That perhaps occasionally the private and voluntary sectors are allowed into schools for careers guidance or some aspects of pastoral support, but allowing them into the core of teaching and learning, as we've heard today, is anathema in most of mainstream Scottish policy. Yet what worked at Newlands was the sense that the entrepreneurial imagination is really not that fundamentally different from the educational imagination. Being bold and, in, and innovative and not hidebound by regulations, however well-meaning these regulations might be, is what made Newlands a success and it's what seems to me works in these other contexts. Entrepreneurial imagination has made an enormous difference in the last couple of decades in the most adventurous schools in London and increasingly in other parts of England where social circumstances have held young people back. The point of this kind of partnership is that it does not assume that consensus is automatically the best way forward. In Scotland we kind of worship consensus but there is no guarantee that consensus produces the right answers. Consensus is good only if it is reached through honest engagement with difficulties and with fundamental differences in approach. Argument about what is wrong with the way we do things is not the enemy of consensus. Argument is the only way of reaching a consensus that will endure. And so my final point today is if there's one overriding message from today's examples of educational success, it is that today has shown us how constructively challenging some of Scotland's Scottish education's taken for granted assumptions is the only way that we're ever going to make progress. Thank you. Thanks, Lindsay. Just a few more uh, questions before we move on to the, the, the final phase. Um, uh, there's a question here about what, what if we let uh, young people sit exams when they and their teacher felt they were ready and not in job lot models which don't reflect where a young person has progressed to and is very intimidating. I'm in interested in people who've been working on these uh, uh, these projects as to whether they think that would benefit the, the, the young people that have been passing through their their halls. Um, is anyone able to take that? Yes. That's exactly, Chris, what we did at Newlands. And we preferred, rather than talking about early presentation, to talk about presentation when ready. For example, some young people came to us and had finished National 4 in mathematics by the September holiday weekend. And they then went on to National 5. Now that didn't correspond to their chronological age, but it certainly motivated them. We had young people who by the end of S4 had gained passes at a higher level. So presentation already was very much our, um, our touchstone and it motivated the young people. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, Ian, as, as well as that, we, you know, we're talking about the, you guys, there's Scran Academy, you know, there's, there's a whole bunch of these projects that we're talking about today. Do you have relationships with each other? Are there partnerships being formed here? Are you all ploughing your own channel, if you like, and, um, and, and sort of never the twain shall, shall meet? And do you think that it would be better were these things organised in a more cohesive and complementary way, or is it just a kind of free-for-all of every project for itself? Well, for example, we had uh, extensive discussions with uh, Laurie O'Donnell and his team uh, before and after uh, their approach was, um, was set up. In terms of Spartans, we had exchange with them as well. I think um, you know, Lindsay was talking about uh, partnerships. I think 
these sort of organisations working in partnership is very much to be desired. But having them all under the same umbrella, if it goes towards the uniformity and conformity, then within that alternative provision wouldn't uh, be a good thing. And do, do you, I know that, that you know the, the, there was and indeed is hope that the Newlands project could be mirrored in other parts of, of Scotland. Um, is, is, do you think that's a model that would actually work for not just Newlands, but some of the other projects as well, where you could actually have these multi-centre organisations? So if you're a kid in Aberdeen, you're getting access to something like Scran Academy as well as something like Newlands uh, as well as the rest. How do we scale up this? Yeah, I was listening to um, uh, Professor Donaldson in his GTC uh, lecture the other night, and uh, for once... I was uh, actually I was quite worried because I found myself agreeing with him when he spoke about uh, being concerned about the idea of a book that thing of things that work, and then you go and pick the thing out the book, and you use that in your situation. And he said that might not be appropriate. We and Kier would go along with this. I'm sure we always said that um, Newlands was not the solution. It was a solution, and it was developed and evolved in that situation. I think um, different strokes for different folks. Here, maybe. Here, have you got anything to add to that? I think the, the diversity is extremely important in the system, and one of the reasons why Scottish education is a slow learner is that Scottish education is remarkably uniform. Therefore, we have very little to learn from our own experience. And that's one of the reasons why I think creating a much more innovative context is absolutely vital. Mm -hmm. I, I do um, think I, we need to be careful with the scale up more, um, a concept though. Scale up is a, is, a, is a politician's dream. I've got a magic bullet and I'll deliver it the yeah. same way right across the country because it worked in one place. What we need by scaling up is these kinds of ecosystems but still done locally because um, they then build on local assets and local opportunities and, and, and local strengths and local wisdom. Um, otherwise, what we will do is replicate one centralised system with another. And yeah, I wonder... Sorry, Chris. I guess one of the unfortunate things is that the, um, the great body of experience and the skill set that was the group of adults at Newlands Junior College has now, to an extent, not been lost, but it's been uh, dissipated as we all went our uh, uh, separate me ways, me doing uh, what I do in advisory work and, and the rest of the teachers working in uh, uh, different schools. And I think um, earlier on, somebody asked on the chat uh, about, you know, in, in general terms in Scotland, and I think one of the dangers is that in a gathering like this one, I could be wrong, but we may have the usual suspects here today, you know, those of us who are uh, creatively minded and a bit of as Neil McLennan said, the, the free thinkers. And that's my question. Um, how do we get beyond that? Because I think we've probably been singularly unsuccessful in doing that uh, up until now. You know, folks say, yeah, yeah, nice idea, but it doesn't fit what we have traditionally. Okay, okay. Um, so uh, I think we are now going to move on to uh, Gillian Hunt, uh, who is really the driving force behind today's conference. Uh, Gillian, are you with us? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Okay, I, I just want to do one of the sort of last things of the event today. Uh, I've been working with Newlands Junior College now for over uh, the last four years. And in that time, I've met the inspirational and motivated young people there, and I continue to do so. Before attending Newlands, as you've heard, these students felt that the students felt that people had stopped believing in them, and some of them even felt that their schools had stopped believing in them. They had amazing potential, and actually, most of them didn't even know that they had that amazing potential. What we're going to do to finish the conference today is that we're going to hear two very, very short films with some messages from those young people. In the first film, you're going to hear from Peter Gordon, who's nearing the end of his apprenticeship as a mechanic. It finishes later this year. 
You're going to hear from Lisa Kane, who is in full-time uh, education at Glasgow Clyde College. And you're going to hear again from Eden Harley, who's in the, his fourth year of employment now, Arnold Clark. So Catherine, if you could show that film and then I'll pop back up at the end of that just to introduce one tiny little last film to you. I really think that like, Newlands would be good for our kids that's disengaged in school and I know there's a lot of kids out there that is disengaged from school and they don't like school and Newlands is a place where they can feel at home, feel as if they're like a family and basically just be relaxed and not have these, pe uh, these teachers jumping down their throat every two seconds. Now I'm three years into my apprenticeship, just about qualified, uh, I'm doing a business course now uh, Alex Stewart's trying to, Alex Stewart's helping me with that, uh, and I'm going to try and open my own garage, but if I didn't have Newlands in my life, I don't know where I would be. Newlands and the staff at Newlands were like my family, like, they took care of me better than my own family did, and I just think really that Newlands should be given a chance to open up somewhere else to give these kids that's disengaged in school and give them another chance to try and improve themselves. There are a lot of people that's left New Orleans and have went on, went on to succeed and I hopefully I'll be the one to go on and succeed and open my own business as well. Sound's gone, Catherine. More confident and it gave me a lot. qualifications and a lot of life lessons that I wouldn't have had if I stayed in school or if I dropped out of school and I think that that option and that pathway should be available in future to like young people that are struggling and that aren't succeeding or being their best self at school because I would like to think like in the future when I have kids if they're ever struggling that they don't think that there's no hope and school's their only option and there's no like alternative for them because I wouldn't be I wouldn't have the confidence I have today and I wouldn't have all the qualifications I have today without new ones. The education relationships and support provided by NGC has given me opportunities that I wouldn't have gotten in mainstream education. I think it's important that every student across Scotland is given this opportunity. It's all important to me now more than ever because last year in February I had my first son. Now, when he grows up, I hope that the opportunities that I had will be available to him. Because really, in a classroom of 30 pupils, they're not all going to learn the same way. And in New England Junior College, it's all about accommodating that and bringing the best out in every student as it's done for me. Thanks, Catherine. Um, so. What we're going to do just in a moment is that we're going to go back to Chris to close the conference. But just before that, we have one very last message. And this time we're going back over to Ross MacArthur, who's in the second year of his apprenticeship. So, Catherine, if you could show us that last film. Junior colleges play a permanent role in the education system uh, and in enough number that kids from across the country um, can get the benefits of them. Um, I also think it would be great if local authorities and government embraced the idea uh, and incorporated the demand of the public system um, whilst maintaining links to business um, and for places of further education uh, similar to the way Newlands was set up. Okay, well, we've had quite the comprehensive look uh, today at uh, some incredible projects um, that are clearly changing lives. Uh, we might think that we're not changing enough lives at the moment um, and I think we certainly need to keep having this conversation to see how we go about doing that but I'm sure many of you like me have been blown away by the individuals who are involved in this project and, and the, the young people who've gone on to achieve things they might otherwise not. I think uh, a time when Scottish education gets uh, sometimes more criticism than praise. Um, you know, you're seeing something rather special today. Uh, certainly the words that keep 
leaping out at me are, are belief and relationships as the the two things that are really helping in these projects to give a chance to, to kids who've maybe just been left by uh, more mainstream education and really it seems to come down to love at the heart of it all um so let, it just remains for me really to to thank everyone who contributed today and to wish you all great uh, success in, in what you're doing. Um, I'd like to thank who, all those who were involved in the various films that we saw, uh, the papers that have been produced, uh, the uh, people that have helped contact the delegates, uh, and particularly my team behind the scenes in Reform Scotland, Catherine and, and Ali, who have been doing a lot while we've been watching to keep things running smoothly. I'll just remind you that delegates will receive a detailed report about Newlands Junior College by email after the event. And you will also receive a copy of Kenny Kemp's book on Newlands when it's published in spring. Again, you'll find Gillian uh, Hunt's uh, email address in your pack. So if you drop her a line with your address, that'll make it easier to get the book to you. Uh, and as I said at the start, we want to continue this conversation by bringing together a small group again on Zoom to discuss practical ways to promote innovation, take forward lessons from future projects and other promising ideas. Uh, we'd like to do this around the middle of February uh, and we'll produce a paper or a report following that, which will be sent out to delegates. So again, contact Gillian if you'd like to be part of that. So it just remains then for me to thank not just our, uh, our presenters today, but, but you uh, for turning out such great numbers uh, to talk and think and listen to uh, this extraordinary range of projects that are ongoing. And I think if we all work together, we can hopefully uh, push in the right direction and maybe make some change in this so that more children can benefit from the types of things that we've seen today. So thank you again, and we look forward to continuing the conversation.